We are The Table, and we are so glad that you have taken time out of your week to join us. Here at The Table, it is our hope to move you forward in life and faith over the course of this message. At The Table, we do things just a bit differently. We pose questions in real time, and we want to give you some time to wrestle with those questions as well. Again, thanks for joining us, and we hope that this message moves you forward. wife and I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, we went to a Christian bookstore, which prior to 25, we didn't even know existed. We are like, y'all got whole bookstores and stuff. And so we went into this bookstore, and we saw like a Christian coffee mug, and I was like, you all got coffee mugs? Like, this is awesome. So we bought a coffee mug, and on the coffee mug, and I bought it because it said Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it said, for if anyone is Christ, there's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And I bought that for my wife because I wanted her to be reminded every single morning when she got up and had her cup of coffee that she and I were no longer who we once were, but that, in fact, we had been made new. So I want to invite you just to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Look that up. Paste that on your mirror in the morning. So when you wake up in the morning, you can look and say, you know what? I'm not who I used to be. I've been made new. And that's a good thing. Well, I want to turn our attention this morning. We're going to continue in our series called Fresh Wind. And I want to turn our attention this morning to the second chapter in the book of of Acts. And the sermon title today is What on Earth? (laughs) What on Earth? But I want to read to us a passage of Scripture for this day. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Do you all know today is Pentecost Sunday? It's the, it's the day of the year that we celebrate what we're going to be talking about in this passage. And when they say they were all together, it was about 120 in total. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a scene and a scenario this would have been. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us, what on earth... (laughs) How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what? on earth what does this mean and i love this next line some of them made fun of them saying i think they've had too much wine what on earth let's pray father we trust you in these moments we've already had something to celebrate this morning now lord we prepare ourselves for what you want to do next For some of us, what we're going to hear is going to be something very fresh. For some of us, it's going to be a reminder. For all of us, it's necessary. So, Lord, we trust ourselves into your hands that you would be faithful with us in these moments, with your word, with your people, with your spirit. And may I, as nothing more than a vessel, 
And in spite of my inabilities, inadequacies, and deficiencies, somehow bear out this good news that can change lives. And when that happens, and as it happens, which we know that you will bring it to pass, we will be certain to give you glory in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. When I first met Earl, I was a recovering skeptic. Now, when I say recovering, that's probably not altogether true, because I don't know that I've changed all that much in the years, but See, toward my late teens and early 20s, I had developed some pretty uh, robust ideas and opinions about Christianity, and specifically about Christians. I was an atheist by the time I was 16 years old. And when I say atheist, I was one of those really annoying atheists that had all the wrong answers to all the right questions, and I didn't mind telling you at all, at any point, in any time, where and how your religion was wrong. But then I had a praying grandma. You know what? Don't ever underestimate the Jedi mind powers of a praying grandma. I'm just telling you, like, she got me alone at a truck stop diner and spoke into my life when I was a freshman in college, and I dialed it up a notch from atheist to agnostic. Like, now it wasn't that I didn't believe in anything, I just didn't want to, I just wanted, I didn't want anything specific attached to it. So, throughout my college years and my first three years of military service, I was the guy who was a little bit antagonistic and patronizing to my Christian believing friends. In fact, I was the guy who would at times say things that would try to get a rise out of Christians, try to, try to make you kind of show out a little bit. I wasn't all that I wasn't all that nice. But the other side of that same coin was that throughout that season of my life, I had also managed to acquire a nasty addiction to alcohol and a whole other host of unholy habits. My wife and I met on my 21st birthday, or so I'm told. We were engaged five months later, married within 11 months of meeting each other, and two weeks later, I was shipping off for the military. And for the first three years of our marriage, we lived in absolute and utter chaos and dysfunction and addiction. But then I found myself alone. Not not with my grandma at a truck stop diner this time, but in a little chapel in Skopje, Macedonia, Macedonia, where I was deployed. And in that little chapel at midnight, and I'll spare you all the details, I found myself in this deeply broken, wounded moment where I'd really come to the end of my rope. And I was sitting there at midnight in this chapel, and I had this profound encounter with a God that I was not adequately uh, understanding at that time, and I was given a promise and a purpose that I didn't deserve. And in that little chapel at midnight, my life was radically changed. Radically changed. And it was in that chapel, as I surrendered my life to Jesus, that that God had made a promise that he was not only going to work in me, but he was going to work in my family. And one month later, through a set of traumatic experiences, My wife back in the States, who we had no connection with one another at that point because we were prepping for a divorce, knelt down in a Nazarene pastor's office, completely separate from me, and met her Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now, I wish I could say that that moment and her moment had remedied every bit of skepticism and doubt that I had in my heart, but I was a work in project progress. So when I returned home from deployment, my wife and I, we, we were going to look for the church where God was, right? So wherever it was. And she said, well, we got to go to that Nazarene church that I got saved in. I said, that Naza, what? I didn't know what that was. I said, okay, we're going one Sunday, and that's it. And then we're going to go somewhere else. We went on that Sunday. We never went anywhere else. And when we were there, it, it was a church that wasn't unlike the table. I mean, it was one of those churches that, 
made room for people no matter where they were on their journey of faith, and, and that would walk with you through your questions and your doubts and your wonders and your worries and all that, that comes with this journey of faith. But it was there that I met Earl. Now, Earl was about six foot four, 300 pound, 45 year old man who worked for the power company climbing electric poles. He was big and bald and looked like Mr. Clean with a goatee with forearms like Popeye. The man stood out, and, 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 and it wasn't just that his physical stature stood out. There was something about him. There was a kindness, and a generosity, and a joy, and a consistency that I watched in this man that I had, that I had not seen. Now remember, I was a skeptic, so I was deeply intrigued by this man's man who sort of lived out this faith in ways. And so I wanted to get close. I wanted to understand. I wanted to make sense. I was like, what on earth is this dude? So then I got close to Earl, and getting close to Earl, I ended up getting close to Ron and Chris. Ron was a twice-retired police officer and veteran, and Chris was a, uh, was a cowboy boot salesman. And there was something about these guys that just confused me and intrigued me. Something about their lives where they bore witness to a Christian faith, and I was like, man, if this is an act, then they have mastered the art of acting. And and, and then I had these moments, I was like, there is no way these dudes are like this outside of Sunday morning. Like, this is the show they put on for Sunday morning. I know when they go home, they treat their wives the same way I do. But the closer I got to these guys, I I realized there was something confusing about their lives. They seemed to live with a resolute commitment to Jesus, a spiritual humility, a passion for his mission, and a victory over sinfulness that I had never seen in all of my life. In fact, in conversations with them, I would come to realize the love that they would have for people, and the sacrifices that they would give of themselves to other people. And I would witness in their lives this this steadfastness when they were attacked or when someone was trying to make them angry, the way in which they would refuse to return insult for insult or evil for evil. And there was just something about these guys that felt so extraordinary. And it didn't make sense to me. I was like, these are normal dudes. I was like, now my pastor acts that way, but I'm sure he gets paid to do that. But these were normal guys. And the closer I got, the more confused I became, the more I found myself going, what on earth? I was captivated by them. I wanted to know what makes you tick. Why are you the way you are? Because it just didn't make any sense to me. Now, I find it interesting how wired we seem to be to, to, to want to quickly explain away anything that, that doesn't make sense to us, right? I love it in this story. They, they encounter something that is so extraordinary, and their first response is, those dudes are drunk. Like, that's the only category that I have for this moment, is that those dudes are drunk. See, what they were witnessing on this day of Pentecost What was happening in the streets was so confusing and so captivating and so intriguing. It made them, it left them scratching their heads and saying, what on earth? Because just moments early, a ragtag bunch of formers had emerged from a room where they had been holed up for almost two weeks, ten days to be exact. By formers, I mean those who had been formerly fishermen and tax collectors formerly conspirators and terrorists, formerly prostitutes and lame people, formerly excluded and disfranchised, people who once were, but were no longer. And you know why? Because they all hung out with Jesus. See, that's what happens, folks, when you hang out with Jesus. Something changes. It's the gift of meeting Jesus that, that our story is no longer as it has been in the past, that something new happens, something emerges. And for many of us, that is our story. And for some of you who are clinging to your old story, it's going to be your story. You just didn't know it yet. But he's coming for you <laughs> because he's looking for you. 
Because every one of those formers was looked for by Jesus because he cares that much. But now, having emerged from that room, about 120 of them in all, there was such this awesome display of power and God's purpose and God's promises for all humankind that everybody else that was watching what was unfolding there in those streets of Jerusalem were left captivated and intrigued and confused and scratching their heads and going, what on earth? Now, I love how, I love how God works in the details. So, this was Pentecost. Some of you are like, yeah, what? what? What's that? So get this. This is so cool. So Pentecost was a yearly festival and feast that celebrate the first fruits of the harvest, but also commemorated the giving of the law of Moses to the, to the Israelites. It was a festival and feast where it was also a pilgrimage. It was one of the three pilgrimages that people came from all over the place to Jerusalem. So they're just happen to be all of these people in Jerusalem at the time that God begins to do this powerful work. And it just happens to be the day when the first fruits of the harvest are recognized in the first fruits of God's spirit being poured out amongst his people and something so profound happened. God decided in that moment to demonstrate his power through a bunch of formers who were also unlikelies. Now I like that. Because this group of 120 that emerged from that room, these would not have been the first folks picked on the playground. Okay, I'm just telling you because some of y'all need to hear that. Some of y'all were like in life, you have felt like you were the person and just kind of at the end of the, okay, we'll take so and so. Right? That's what these 120 were. They were like, oh, all right, we'll take Peter. You sure you don't want Peter? No, I got, I'll take him. That's fine. That's who these folks were. Don't you love a God who chooses the unlikelies to work through to accomplish his purposes and display his power? I think that's a really cool story because I know my story and I know that I was an unlikely. And it was there as they stood in the streets speaking in ways that left people astounded, bearing witness to a courage that left people in awe, that they were left thinking, what on earth is happening? trying to make sense. You know, someone in that crowd was like, isn't that Peter? Like two months ago, Peter was the guy who had abandoned Jesus in the middle of his need. He had just completely left the stage, said, I got got nothing, and took off. And now Peter's standing in the streets proudly and boldly proclaiming this message of Jesus. What on earth? Surely there's got to be something to this. Surely there's got to be an explanation. Surely there's, there's got to be a neat, nice, tidy box that I can tie this up to and sort of put on the shelf. Surely there's got to be a way to disregard this. That's what happens when God's power is poured out amongst us. We begin to see something happen in the lives of others that they bear witness to something that leaves us scratching our heads and going, what on earth. But here's part of the problem. Their assessment of the 120 and my assessment of Chris and Ron and Earl was wrong because all I could see was the public witness of their lives. All that they could see in the streets was the public witness. All they could see was the demonstration of power that God had brought into their lives and they couldn't make sense of that. What they didn't see was the work that they had done in private. Can we talk about that for a moment? Because what they didn't see was the confession of need. What they didn't see was the communion, the drawing close to God in desperation. What they didn't see was the consecration, the giving of themselves over. What they didn't recognize is that the public witness is always dependent on the private preparation. We as Christians need to recognize that the public display of God's work through us is only made credible because of the personal preparation that happens in us. See, there's a 10-day gap between what I talked about this week, last week, and this week. 10 days between Jesus ascending to the Father 
and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. There's a 10-day gap that I don't think we can negate. I think we got to pay attention to what happens in that 10-day gap. See, for 10 days, 120 people were sequestered in a small room together, 10 days of nothing but heartfelt prayer and fasting, and during that time, this group would have to come face-to-face with anything and everything that could come get in the way of God's desire and his purpose to use them. 10 days. For 10 days, they got real and raw and vulnerable. 10 days. Ten days, they put it all out there on the line. You know what they did in that ten-day period? As they were preparing for this moment that everybody else was scratching their head about, ten days, they had to come face-to-face with their past. Can we just get to the public display without having to do that? No, you don't. You bump up against your past where you begin to recognize all of the moments where I've come up a little bit short, all of the moments when I've let Jesus down, all the moments when I should have made better decisions, all of those moments when I've left in the wake of my life broken dreams and broken hopes and broken relationships and broken stuff. i got to come to terms with my past. i got to come to terms with all of the stuff that I've carried around as baggage throughout my life that has continually held me down from stepping out and stepping into the journey and the relationship that God has longed for me to have with him. For 10 days, they had to realize that their past performance, like I said last week, was not an exemption from their present purpose. But it's never just our past, is it? It's also our present. We've got to face our present we got to look ourselves in the mirror in the moment and not just about what we've done in the past, but we have to see ourselves for how we see ourselves, the shame and the guilt and the arrogance and the pride and the prejudices and the biases and all of those things that I am currently living in right now. Every bit of reluctance that I have in my life right now that keeps me from being used by God based upon my perceived desires or ambitions or the things that I long to do and to be in this world, and I've got to bump up face to face with whether or not This is the life right now that I am destined to live. So i got to reckon with my past. i got to come to terms with my my present. And then i got to deal with my future. You know what I found when I became a Jesus follower? I looked at my story and I was like, Jesus, I want to give you my story so that you can redeem it but I need you to leave me the pen in case I want to write the chapters that come next. Probably the only one in the room that's ever done that. Jesus, you can have the really bad parts of my story, and you can make those better. The ones that I'm not proud of, you can forgive. But as I look into the future, there's still some plans I've got. So I'll keep the pen. I mean, we'll confer a little bit. I mean, I'll have my devotional time with you. At times, I'll just ask you to baptize as a decision I've already made. Find spiritual ways to justify that. But I'm going to hold on. But up in the room, you begin to realize that pen's not yours. In that preparation time, you begin to realize, Jesus gets the pen and the copyright. Like, if, if I'm going to if I'm gonna live the kind of life where God's spirit is poured out of my life and power, then I have to yield myself and everything that will be into his hands, recognizing that he knows better what my future chapters need to look like than I do. <sighs> That's tough. Past, present, future. But here's the beauty of this. The Bible tells us that in that time of personal preparation, and a preparation that often happens away from the eyes of others, that that personal preparation gave way to the provision of God's power, which was the coming of his Holy Spirit. 
And in that room, because everyone had done, they had been in that same spot doing the same thing, chasing down the same God, giving themselves over to the same promises, consecrating the same kinds of stuff. Because they were in that moment and in that place and in that time, the Spirit of God, in Greek, the pneuma, the breath, the wind, the breath of God comes breathing into this room and it begins to move into them and through them and and fills them in a way that none of them could have ever anticipated. The Holy Spirit comes. Now, it's really cool what happens, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but i got to talk about this Holy Spirit thing, because that'll, if you're new to Christianity, that'll tweak you out a little bit. It's like, Holy Spirit, what? What is that? And then you'll hear some Christians like, the Holy Spirit is what you feel when you worship. Feels good. I had a lady used to call him, the Holy Spirit gives you glory bumps. And the Holy Spirit may, yes, feel good on a Sunday morning, but that is not the sum total of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. If Jesus is God in flesh, then the Spirit is God's presence not only around us in, in those worship moments, but God's presence in us. And, and can, I say this, can I say this to you? The greater the room we make for him in that preparation, the more of us that God fills. Did you you know that? The more presence we, we have of God in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it does some things very specific. When the Holy Spirit comes, it draws us into communion with God. His desires become my desires. His plans become my purpose. His love becomes my compelling force. His power breaks the chains that binds me from the calling that God has prepared for me in advance. His fruit is born in my life, producing a holiness that if you would have told me 25 years ago would ever be possible in Jeff Stark's life, I'd have laughed at you. His strength fills us in ways when we are weak that we have trouble making sense of. When the Holy Spirit comes, it draws us into such a profound sense of communion with God. But it's not just that. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit doesn't just give us some epic worship moment when we're all gathered together. The Spirit actually draws us into deep communion with one another. Did you know the Spirit of God is what constitutes the church on Pentecost Sunday? The church is birthed on that day. And the church is rebirthed over and over again through the power of the Spirit. The church is not an association of people who come under the really cool brand of the table. The church is the people of God who have been brought together by the Spirit of God who gather at this place called the table for a specific set of reasons because collectively we as the people of God make God's pursuits our purpose collectively, where we give ourselves collectively to the mission of God, and where collectively we don't allow any politics or any identities or any allegiances get in our way to the first commitment we have as Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what happens when we come together, and then we do so, some really cool, crazy stuff as a, as a collective community where people in the community of Joliet go, what on earth? Have you seen those table folks? What is wrong with them? Now, we could give them a list, but I think what they're talking about is the Holy Spirit. But it's not just that God brings us into communion with him and with one another. And I love this. Oh, this is so good. The Spirit draws us into communion with the world. When the Spirit of God comes, it doesn't just leave us savoring the moment in a room. You know, someone, someone in that 120 was like, this is so delicious, stay here. Just feel this. It's like the non-ending worship service. Just sing one more chorus. And that's not how the Spirit works. Because when the Spirit's at work, eventually the Spirit goes. And it breathes the church out into the world. 
and it breathes the church out into the lives of those who have yet to meet him. And it breathes the church out in such a way that through the church, the power of God is witnessed so that everybody watching is scratching their head and intrigued and captivated and left going, what on earth? When the work of God is done in private, it spills out into the public in very powerfully missional and redemptive ways. That's what the people in the streets were watching. That's what I was seeing in Earl's life that I didn't understand. See, Earl got me. I got close to Earl, and I hung out with him any time I could. I wanted to be wherever Earl was. So then Earl says to me, he says, why don't you come to men's retreat? Men's retreat. There's such a thing. I was like, men's retreat? What's men's retreat? He goes, it's a bunch of dudes. We get together. We, we worship Jesus. And we, at a campground, I was like, do we shoot stuff or fish for stuff or like, race stuff or something he's like no we eat and we we pray and we worship and we and i was like that's a thing he's like that's a thing sure never thought i'd go into a christian bookstore either so why not so i went to i went to men's retreat and i was there with ron and chris and and earl and i kept my eye on earl so i wanted to make sense of it so in this men's retreat, guys were doing, like, weird stuff. Like, there was these pieces of wood that were nailed together that they called an altar. And they would, like, come forward and they would, like, kneel at them and they would, like, pray. And God would do some things. And I'm, like, I'm like standing in the back, just my arms crossed, going, what is this? And then I watched Earl. Preacher spoke about something. Earl gets up and he goes to the altar. Mr. Clean with a goatee. And he kneels down at that altar and he starts weeping. And I was like, folks, where I come from, there's no crying in baseball. (laughs) You don't cry. (laughs) Guys don't cry. But I'm watching this and I felt like the Lord said, Jeff, if you want to know what on earth makes Earl who he is, It's nothing on earth. It's my provision from heaven. And what makes Earl so captivating and intriguing to you is the kind of work that he's doing right now. And it was in the midst of that moment of vulnerability and him being real and raw that I discovered that the origin of his purpose and the origin of his power was nothing unique to Earl, but it was what God had planted in Earl as God had filled Earl with his spirit. And I'm standing in the back with my arms crossed and I'm watching Earl weep up front and God speaking to me. And all of a sudden, tears start to come. I was like, what is this? And I committed that day. That whatever made Earl, Earl, I needed that. Because I didn't want to just put on a show on a Sunday morning when I came to church. I wanted to live it out every single day. I wanted to live in such a way that left people scratching their heads. So Earl took me under his wing, my wife and I. And he started meeting with us, not unlike the mentorship that you do here at the table. He started meeting with us, and, and he would talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, and he would talk about the consistency that the Spirit provides, and he'd talk about the love that the the Spirit instills in our hearts for others and for God. And, and I said, i got to have that. Because I know alone Jeff is not capable or able to fulfill any of the purposes for which God has intended my life. i got to have that. So God moved and helped my wife and I. God gave us experiences of God that it's hard for me to put into words today. But I can tell you that the two of us, we 
go back home, we see our family and our friends, people who knew us back when. But now we're seeing the new. And they look at me and they go, what on earth? And I would just look at them and I would say, not on earth, but from heaven. And here's the beautiful part of that. It's not just a gift for Earl or a gift for Ron or a gift for Chris or a gift for Jeff. It's a gift for you. The same power is made possible for you as was for us, as is for us that will enable you to live the kind of life that God has purposed for you to live with a consistency that will leave others scratching their heads. But you got to be hungry. you got to be desperate. you got to realize your dependency. And you got to seek it. Some of this will happen as you prepare yourself in the private of your own space. Some of that is going to happen as in your mentorship you work through your past and your present and your future. As you come to terms with some stuff in your life, some of that is going to happen as you as you confess, acknowledge, as you draw near, commune with God, and as you consecrate, give yourselves over to God. That preparation is going to provide the pathway for God's power to be poured out into your life. So rather than just have a moment, I want to invite you into a season of preparation. I want to invite you to take seriously these next steps in your journey. They've got next steps here at the table that will help you in your journey. Take seriously your next step so that you can prepare yourself for the provision of God's power at work in your life. Now every week, we do a little bit of that preparation through communion. The reminder of what Christ has done for us so, so that we couldn't, because we couldn't do it for ourselves, so that God can do in us what only God can do. So I want to invite you as we prepare ourselves for this last song to sing, as we think about the kind of preparation that God wants to lead us towards, as we think about God's filling of our lives through His Holy Spirit, I want us to take this, this communion and I want you to peel back the top layer, which, which reveals a wafer. And this wafer is representative of the body of Jesus Christ. It's a body broken. So, and I love this, going back to that song we sang, it's a body broken so that we could be made whole. So that the brokenness that has been doesn't mean the brokenness that we live in currently. We can be made whole. And it was blood poured out for us, a sign of a new covenant. And that new covenant, I love it, it's scriptural. The new covenant is not where we just simply follow a law that's etched on stone, but instead we follow something that's etched in our hearts that, that becomes for us this compelling force that, that leads us to live in a way that leaves the world scratching its head wondering what is different about you. So I invite you to, to break the bread and to share it with me in this moment. Lord, thank you for this gift. Thank you for this promise of brokenness that makes us whole. As we receive this, we receive it in thanks. Now I invite you to take the cup receive the gift of the blood of Christ poured out on your behalf. Lord, I I look at a <laughs> I look I look out in this crowd and I see a bunch of formers and unlikelies. Which seems like that's where you do your best work. So maybe you go ahead and do your best work in this room with these people.
to be used by you in this community in ways that will leave people scratching their head wondering what on earth. And then they'll be able to point to the source of the power that's at work within them so that you get all the glory. So Lord, may we be formers and unlikelies, ordinary folks used in extraordinary ways. For the power of your Holy Spirit.